there are some 2 billion people a part of the app world. And inside of that massive audience, you can find a micro audience of a few million people here and there. And if you get to your game to those people, and they like your genre, your art style, cultural slant, or whatever it is, you can have a really nice business. Only a few people can be king or supercell, but there's a lot of business that can be perfectly fine if they manage to connect with real audiences. Unity co-founder David Helgeson in a 2014 interview with Pocket Gamer. All right then, uh, let's begin then. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll just open up with an icebreaker. Well, no, we should introduce ourselves first. Hello there, my name is UMD Grielsen, editor for the Data Horde blog, and here is... Here is. Introduce yourself. Sure. The Mad Pro. <laughs> so, uh, let's actually get started about talking about things, because, like, there was a big kerfuffle about Unity recently, and I think there's a decent question to be asked about, uh, what's that going to mean for the ver various games that it's using, because more things use it now than practically any other engine, which means that you could have a lot of things that are suddenly in question of how long they're going to be allowed to exist. Yes, yes. I've also seen quite a few game developers kind of threatening Unity, not so much players, that unless the new demands are a bit more reasonable, they might delist their games, such as, uh, I think, Cult of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That was one. Uh, yeah, I think... Uh... I don't know how seriously Cult of the Lamb people are about it, but it's definitely something to consider, because I, I can't help but imagine that's going to be a popular option for having to deal with the issue if it doesn't, if the whole matter doesn't just get undone entirely, which is, honestly, given the track record for these sorts of claims is unlikely. It might get reduced, but it's probably not going to be removed. Yeah, I guess just to bring everyone up to speed with things... Unity installed a a runtime fee. Basically, what they think they can get away with doing is charging a fee for popular games that is tracked per install. How are they going to track installs? They haven't said, and by all accounts, the, the answer seems to be they're going to guess. Really? I was just expecting something more intrusive, like uh, bundling something into every Unity installation. Well, yeah, b but the problem is that they're trying to make this claim retroactive, and judging from the PR responses that they've had about it, it doesn't actually seem like they know how, how they are tracking installs, because, like, it's not something that they have just added. They're trying to track all installs of the Unity runtime, not just the latest versions. So I'm pretty sure the way they're tracking installs is the guess. Maybe educated guess might be a better term, because the way uh, I guess many people are framing it is the fact that it feels like kind of a hunt after successful indie developers. So Cult of the Lamb was a- Well, no, not indie developers. They're spe from the way that I've heard about it is that they're going specifically after Companies like Mioho, who are gaining lots of money, and Unity want some of that precious cash. Yeah, I, I meant successful. So, yeah. well, no, it's not. I, I wasn't. I wasn't criticizing the successful part. I was criticizing the indie. No, they're going after free-to-play stuff. Yeah, especially, which is quite confusing. So they don't care so much about the company's own monetization strategy, but the simple fact that product was made in Unity a the product is being distributed widely. The product is making loads and loads of money and they aren't C. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, what do you think should be done about it? What do you think is being done about it? I mean, what should be done about it is just don't. But what is going to be done about it, I'm not sure yet. I, I feel like the story is definitely still developing, because, like, it's going to be a while before we actually get anything solid about what's changing from this horrible, horrible PR move. But I think but we are supposed to be about archiving. I think the question is, so what's this going to mean for the companies that ha have to rely on this, and... Should we be worried about the ways people are going to circumvent this? Well, uh, I, I guess the classic solution is 
just have a separate hard drive you never connect to the internet. I imagine people find ways to keep running delisted games as you do. So yeah. people who already have well, the but, games. I mean, yeah, but I mean, it's not just saving the games. It's also about like finding them. Because like, it's not just about the the can we get the games onto our systems and and save them. That in in this case, that's the easy part. The hard part is is trying to to deduce which games are at risk of of going poof. Yeah, and like you said, the fact that this is kind of a targeted thing, but they're trying to be very subtle about it, they being a Unity... Yeah, I mean, like, it, in theory it's targeted, but really, it's more, it's going to, it's going to affect darn well near everything, but, well... So, let's see, it's just, like you said, way too early to speculate much in the way of... Is this just the way things are going to happen, or will there be any change of heart? On the part of Unity, it seems to be quite ambiguous, but those developers that are threatening with uh, delisting their games seem pretty set on it as is. Whether or not we'll, well see I mean, non-Unity like... ports or something, well, that's later. That's definitely something we're going to just like... be asking it well Not exactly yeah. Uh, yeah I was going to say that it's that it's like this is definitely like this is one of those things that that only like a handful of people actually ever thought was a good idea and everybody else is crying foul at but but the question is just more of a what what's going to happen when or if this gets rolled out and how is that going to affect the general landscape? Uh, I used to joke with a lot of people that Unity ended up becoming the new Flash Flash player, that is, in many ways. And that it appeals to a very particular kind of developer who just wants to throw together a bunch of multimedia and have something working very fast. It was good for that. Not so much was the focus on optimization or much else. It was good for, I don't want to sound presumptuous here, but kind of artsy independent games. So, well, I'm, much like I mean, Flash, it's... it suffered from a kind of uh, criticism that Unity games are low quality asset dumps of uh, people just putting very nice looking images and very nice looking sound, but the games themselves being generally not very mechanically balanced it didn't feel well it's kind of portrayed in a way like uni games aren't that professional even after so many years i don't think people have been able to fully shake off that stigma i'm not quite sure how much of that is is quite the issue other other than just like making people actually care about this and people care about this yeah uh there has been a lot of visible protest as far as uh or game developers and the usual suspects are concerned. Sorry, our game developers. Game developers on Reddit seem mad. Twitter. Is... Are we calling it X now? Uh... No. Likewise, I've seen quite a few friends on Discord taking shots at Unity, saying it wasn't that good anyway. That people should switch to Godot or Unreal. There have comparable uh, availability to Unity prior kind of revised and updated rules. So from the game developer perspective, I think it's going to be maybe one or two years of trauma, but people will adapt in some way. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, like, the question here isn't too, too, like, the big question isn't too much about the, if you're sure so much as, how is that going, how is that going to affect everything that's already using this stuff? Hmm. Could you be a bit more specific? Because, like, the thing that I, I'm actually won wondering about isn't so much, like, the games that... Isn't, isn't so much, like, the... The... The devs that are... All... Or, like, the devs of the future. My my actual question is about, like... The the devs that released the game, re forgot about it, and then suddenly Unity comes in saying, Oh, by the way, pay up. Yeah. So I just kind of assume that someone somewhere will own that property. That's kind of how it goes, right? So unless uh, like the last possible owner wants 
bankrupt or something. It'll just be usual business, just people uh, asking for money on successful games. Well, I, yeah, it's just more like this. This is a move that is that is likely to bankrupt somebody without without the devs actually realizing what the heck is going on. Because, like, all it takes is one little tick into the category, and suddenly, poof. Yeah, it is overly strict in the way it is right now. Actually, I think it might be a good idea to read out the price tiers specifically. So like, if I remember correctly, it's, like, once you hit 200,000 downloads, it is 20 cents for, for every install. Effective on January 1st, 2024. Two conditions have yeah, to be met. So that, the game yeah. has passed a minimum revenue threshold in the last 12 months, and the game has passed a minimum lifetime install count. Huh. The Unity runtime fee will only apply to those that have made 200,000 USD or more in the last 12 months and have at least 200,000 lifetime game installs for users of Unity Personal and Unity Plus. And for Unity Pro and Unity Enterprise, those thresholds are 1 million US dollars or more in the last 12 months. And having uh, at least a million lifetime game installs. So that's interesting. And why do you think they're doing it now of all times? Well, okay, the thing about it is that... Because, like, I mentioned earlier that, that they're trying to get from to play stuff so it's a it's likely that the reason why they're doing this is just more of they are trying to take advantage of the new popular new popular thing without really much regard for what's actually happening down on the ground because like this is definitely an, a decision an executive made because like you have evidence that even the actual programmers at unity thought no this is a bad idea don't but of course no one listened Presumably. They're trying to kind of play two sides at the same time. When you go to the Unity homepage, you have this uh, section that says grow with Unity, do more with Unity, imagine with Unity, showcasing games made by people. Well, I mean, there's a difference between the user-facing side and the investor-facing side, and, and you're just looking at the user. And if you're going to the Unity website, you're looking at the user-facing side, <laughs> simply put but they do want people growing with Unity, well, at least prior to 2024. Well, no, what they, what they want people is, what they want is people stuck with Unity, because then they can get away with stupid things like this, and it is either adapt or lose several years worth of time. Anyway, do we have anything else to say about this, or are... We should probably find, like, a positive note to conclude on. I... I mean, I don't think there is much of a positive note left to speak on, other than, oh dear, hopefully this doesn't, this doesn't stick. Yeah, speaking of, you did mention backlash from employees, I think the... Like, there was, wasn't there like a death threat at some point? I just read memo, but if there were death threats gotten into it, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> Employees at Unity are on the edge after intense backlash of the company's franchises for developers culminated in a death threat by one of their own colleagues. Ouch. Yeah, wow. Well. Protest is rough. I guess, uh... <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it's worth seeing a silver lining here that, uh... It is definitely a struggle within Unity as a company culture, whether they do want to keep appealing to people as... Because I mean, like, because I mean, like, this is definitely a shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, you know I mean, like, this is a shooting yourself in the foot sort of situation. It's chances are this is going to blow up in in, in their face, get sued out of existence. Because, fun fact, Pokemon Go runs on that engine. Yeah. Or it's going to be run back when the re realization that oh, we're going to see Nintendo lawyers soon. Gets to that. It's actually a very good point, because I do recall that these changes don't just apply to the personal accounts 
Uh, when you're talking about something like Pokemon Go or Hearthstone, these uh, games that did have kind of big companies behind them, they are also going to be subject to these additional fees. And they are not going to be very happy at all. It's just going to hurt everyone, pretty much. So, yeah, the, I was saying the silver lining here seems that the fact that there's so much internal protest really does show that it's going to be a very difficult decision to push. And Unity might not remain as Unity. Quite a ironic name now. But uh, I think on that we've said everything we have to say on this. Just uh, hoping for the best, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, depending on how the situation escalates, we might end up discussing preservation of Unity games, but I hope not to do so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, it's a hope that we don't don't have to do it, but probably something to uh, keep in mind. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but Flashpoint does have a Web Unity collection, at least, right? Yeah, because... Because there used to be a plugin for that, and then that died. Uh, it's all HTML5 now. <laughs> well, I mean, at least now it's, it's using something that is well well standardized instead of the old plugin API from from an ancient browser that we've kept around because it's still a little too important to get rid of. Alrighty. I guess before closing off, uh, our friends over at yeah, our friends over at Gaming Alexandria and Hit Save are running a fundraiser. Did you know Donkey Kong's programming was outsourced by Nintendo to a company called Ikigami to Shinki? In 1997, one of those Ikigami employees wrote his own take on the making of Donkey Kong based on the documentation he'd held on to since 1981. Critical Kate is teaming up with Gaming Alexandria and Hit Save to fundraise a complete translation by shmooplations.com, who will host the translation once it's available to the public. And I believe we'll just leave a link in the podcast description for anyone interested. And that seems to be the only headline I have after five minutes of crawling. All right, then. Alright, so I'm not sure if data log is yet a regular thing. I will probably continue, we can probably continue the pattern of noting what date the podcast was filmed. This was, well, it's 16, September 16th for you, September 17th for me, because I'm in Europe. So, yeah, so, September 6th, uh, actually, hold on a minute, per Greenwich Mean Time, it, it is 10.59pm at September 16th, 2023, as we recorded this. Alrighty. We should probably come off with a kind of farewell catchphrase. Do you have any in mind? And until then, keep circulating the tapes, and we shall see you next time. Yeah, that's right. Keep Bye. circulating the tapes. That's a good one. Till next time.